Hello, this is me again, Georgia May Mossholder. And here I am with Canadian West Collection, When Comes the Spring, Chapter 8, Mountain Lake. We were up early the next morning. We had a quick breakfast and then went to prepare ourselves for the trip up the mountain. Wynn had gone to the kitchen to pick up our lunch, which he put in a backpack along with a good supply of water. I dressed while he was gone, not wanting even my husband to see me in the ugly pants. I wasn't going to look at myself in the mirror. I didn't want to know what I looked like. I walked to the dresser to pick up a scarf and accidentally got a full look at myself. Later, I was glad I did. The sight stopped me short and resulted in me doubling over with laughter. Wynn found me like this. He wasn't sure at first if I was really amused or just hysterical. Look at me, I howled. I look like an unsightly bag of lumpy potatoes. When Wynn discovered that I really was amused at how I looked, he laughed with me. The bulky panks, pants bagged out at unlikely points, hiding my waist in any hint of a feminine shape. I had looped a belt around my waist and gathered the pants as tightly about myself as they could. And this only made them bulge more. Well, they are a bit big, Wynne confessed. I guess I should have asked you about the size. Well, I wouldn't have been able to tell you anyway never having worn pants before. Oh well, they'll do. I stopped to roll up the legs and expose the awkward boots on my feet. Are you about ready? asked Wynne, when we both stopped laughing at the spectacle I made. Ready, I answered, standing to my full height and saluting. We laughed again and headed for the door. Wynne, was kind enough to take me out the back way to avoid meeting other hotel guests. We circled around and followed the path to the mountain trail and began our long climb upward. We hadn't gone far when I realized what Wynne had meant. I had to grab for branches and roots in order to pull myself upward. Time after time, Wynne rich reached to assist me. We climbed slowly with frequent rests. I knew Wynne was setting an easy pace for me, and I appreciated it. Every now and then I would stop to gaze back over the trail we had just climbed. It was incredibly steep. I could catch a glimpse of one valley or another through the thickness of the trees. I could hardly wait to be above the timberline to view the lonely world beneath us. By noon, we had reached our goal. Sheer rocks stretched up and up beyond us. Below us lay the valley with the little town of Banff nestled safely within its arms. It truly took my breath away. Here and there, I could see the winding path we had just climbed as it twisted in and out of the undergrowth beneath us. It's breathtaking, I whispered, still panting slightly from the climb. Oh, Wynne, I'm so glad we came. Wynne stepped over to wrap an arm securely about me. Me too, was all he said. We found a place to have our lunch. By then I was ravenous. Wynne tossed his coat onto a slice of rock and motioned for me to be seated. I did, drinking in the sight before me. Where's the lake? I asked him. See that ragged outcropping of rock there? He pointed. I nodded. It's just on the other side of that. Does it take long to get there? Only about half an hour. Let's hurry. I prompted. Wynne laughed at my impatience. We have lots of time, he assured me. It's faster going down than coming up. He took my hand and we bowed together 
to thank God for the fruit food provided. Wynne's prayer also included thanks for the sight that stretched out before us and our opportunity to share it together. I tightened my grip on his hand thinking back on how close we had come to not making the climb. I looked down at the funny pants I was wearing. They no longer shocked me. They only brought a bubble of laughter. We were almost finished with our lunch when we heard another we heard other voices. Another group had also made the climb. They were getting very close and, and I was looking about for a place to hide. I recognized one of the voices. It belonged to a very fashionable lady I had seen in the hotel lobby the day before. Oh my goodness, whatever would she think of me when she spied me in the insufferable pants? I could see no place to shield myself and and then I braced myself and began to chuckle. So what? I'd likely never see the woman again in my life. The pants had provided me with a very pleasant day with my new husband. They were nothing that I needed to be ashamed of. I took another bite of sandwich and flashed Wynne a grin. He had been watching me to see which way I would choose to run. A man appeared. He was tall and dark, with very thin shoulders and a sallow face. He looked like he was more used to trolley cars and taxis than his own legs, and I wondered how he had managed to make the climb. Well, he did seem to be enjoying it and turned to give his hand to the person who followed him. I was right. It was the attractive young woman. I wondered how she had managed to climb a mountain with her hair so perfectly in place. Her body came slowly up over the sharp rise and into view. I gasped. She too was dressed in ugly men's pants. Wynne and I looked at one another, trying hard to smother our laughter. At that moment she spotted us and called out from where she was hoisting herself up. Isn't it absolutely glorious? She had an accent of some time, kind. I couldn't place it at the moment. Around my bit of sandwich, I called back, Yes, isn't it? They came over to where we were seated and flopped down on the rock perch beside us, both breathing heavily. I've never done anything like this before in my life, said the young man. I had a hard time talking him into it at first, informed the woman to my surprise. You've done it before? I asked her. With my father, many times, he loved to climb. She looked perfectly at home in her pants and stretched out her legs to rest them from the climb. This is your first time? She asked me, sensing that it must be. For me it is, I answered. My husband has been here before. She gave Flynn a win, a fleeting smile. Once you've been, she stated simply, you want to come back and back and back. Me, I never tire of it. Well, it's a sight, all right, Wynn agreed. I suddenly remembered my manners. I looked at our packed lunch. There were still some sandwiches left. Here, I said passing the package to them. Won't you join us? Oh, we brought our own, she was quickly responded, and he lifted the pack from his back. We just needed to catch our breath a bit. We sat together, enjoying the view and our lunch. We learned that they too were honeymooners from Boston. She had pleaded for a mountain honeymoon and he had consented, rather reluctantly he admitted, but he was so thankful now that he had. He was an, an accountant with a business firm, and she was the pampered daughter of a wealthy lawyer. Her father was now deceased, and she was anxious to have another climbing mate. Well, her, her new husband hardly looked hardy enough to fill the bill, but he seemed to have more pluck than one would imagine. They were planning to take on another mountain or two, 
before returning to Boston. After chatting for some time, Wynne stated that we'd best be going if we wanted to see the lake before returning, and the young woman agreed. It was a steep climb back down the mountain, she stated, one that must be taken in good light. We went on bidding them farewell and wishing them the best in their new marriage, which they returned. I got to my feet unembarrassed by my men's pants. If a wealthy girl from Boston could appear so clad, then I suppose that a fashion-conscious gal from Toronto could do likewise. The trail around the mountain to the little lake was actually perilous in spot spots. I wondered how in the world any woman would have ever been able to make it in a skirt. She wouldn't. It was just that simple. I was glad for my unattractive pants that gave me easy movement. I was also glad for Wynne's hand which often supported me. The lake was truly worth the trip. The blue was as deep as the cloudless sky above us and the surface of the lake was as smooth as glass. It, it looked as though one should surely be able to step out and walk on it. So unrippled it was. Yet, when we got close and I leaned over carefully to get a good look into its depths, I was astonished to discover just how deep it was. Because of the clearness of the water, one could see every rock and every shadow. I stood up and carefully stepped back, feeling a bit dizzy with it all. We did not linger long. The climb back down the mountain was a long one, so we knew we had to get on the trail. We met the other young couple. They still talked excitedly as they walked carefully over the sharp rocks and slippery places. I expected that their future would hold many such climbs. In a way, I envied them. The North held no such mountains, at least not in the place where Wynne had been presently stationed. Wynne had said the mountains did not stretch way up to the North Country as well, but they were for the most part uninhabited, so very few men were assigned to serve there. I was sorry for that. I would have liked to live in the mountains. We felt our way slowly back down the trail. <laughs> in a way, I found the climb down more difficult than the climb up had been. It seemed that one was forever having to put on the brakes. And it wasn't always easy to be sure just where one's brakes were. On more than one occasion, I started sliding forward much faster than I intended to. Wynne was right. One did need to sit down and attempt to ease down the steepest parts in a most undecorous fashion. What if Mother could see me now? I thought unruffably, unruffily. I grasped for roots, branches, rocks, anything I could get my hands on to slow my descent. By the end of the day, my hands were scratched, in spite of borrowing Wynne's leather gloves for the worst places. My men's pants were a sorry mess of mountain earth and forest clutter, and my hair was completely disheveled. However, I still wore a happy smile. It had been some day a memory I would always treasure. We stopped at a gushing mountain stream. I knelt down and bent forward for a drink of the cold, clear water. It had come directly from an avalanche above, Wynne informed me, and I was willing to believe him. The water was so cold it made my fingers tingle and hurt my teeth as I drank it. We didn't really need the drink. Our backpack still held water we had carried with us. But Wynne felt that to make the day complete, I must taste the mountain water. 
I agreed. I wiped the drips from my face and shook my hands free of the coldness and told Wynne how good it tasted. Wynne drank too. As a reminder to himself that he had been right, no, water on, no other water on earth tastes quite like that of a mountain stream. Um, that's where I'm going to close for today. I'll be back tomorrow with Chapter 9, Back to Calgary. See you soon.